Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Dan Lynch and Jonathan Bennett joins me. We're going to be talking about news that's current. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Floss Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes enterprise-level security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz, Dan Lynch, and Jonathan Bennett. Episode 574, recorded April 15th, 2020. News Roundup. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. From access to authentication to passwords, LastPass manages every entry point to your business so you can mitigate risk while improving employee productivity. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stunnage.com, bringing you each week. Movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it. Projects you may want to download right after this show. I bet today's show is not either of those, but I always have that sort of litany that I have. So joining me this week is not one co-host, but two co-hosts. Jonathan Bennett, welcome back to the show. Hey, it's good to be here. Great. Uh, and you're in Oklahoma, I presume? Yes, yes. I'm I'm here in the corporate headquarters. Uh, the Let's see, corporate headquarters and now uh, quarantine zone in the Flyover City of Oklahoma. <laughs> yes. And Dan Lynch also uh, joining me once again. Welcome back. Hey, Randall. It's good to be back. I'm uh, I'm not in my usual location of uh, my studio, but I am in my parents' house, which is not too far away, about five minutes away. But you, uh, the people with the video feed will be relieved to see there are still some plants behind me. Apparently, okay. I'm trying to get trying to point at them. Yeah. Um, yeah, people seem to like it when there are plants behind me. Unfortunately, I can't do much about the big strange light, but uh, but we have got yeah. some interesting uh, interesting fo- uh, flo- fauna. Is that fauna or flora? I don't know. We've got some plants anyway. Good to be back. I think <laughs> isn't that fauna? No, fauna is animals, right? So flora is is uh, plants. And uh, I am for the last time in probably uh, a month or two at least. I am in the Tijuana kitchen set. I am heading home tomorrow, presuming they let me cross the border. I haven't had any symptoms of uh, coronavirus, and I've been holed up here for four weeks. So uh, I should be okay. The only people I've seen are Uber Eats drivers, and I make sure to wash my hands right after I pick up my food. Um, So uh, we have a bit of an unusual show today. We had a guest scheduled for uh, many weeks, and the paperwork didn't come in in time. And I can't do anything without the paperwork. I need their bios. I need their Skype handles. I need, um, you know, the show notes. We do have the we did have the show notes. So we at least had like the list of questions and the list of URLs. But that's not quite enough to do the show. So uh, I didn't get some of that until two thirty this morning. So we had a plan B in place, uh, which Jonathan Bennett is definitely uh, a key part of. We're going to be doing another news show. We're going to be covering what's current, what's interesting, uh, all that sort of stuff. I haven't studied this too much, so I'm going to come into it uh, a little cold. Um, let me uh, let me pull up my ad because we're going to have an ad here in just a second, and then we'll get started with the actual show. So this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. As you're preparing your remote workforce, it's important to keep security top of mind while with aiding employee productivity. Transitioning to a full work from home environment can be complicated. LastPass is here to make the transition easier without decreasing security. With an uptick in coronavirus-related phishing attacks, LastPass reduces the risk of phishing schemes by never autofilling passwords on suspicious websites. For remote employees accessing your corporate VPN, LastPass adds an additional layer of security directly to your VPN through biometric multi-factor authentication. Regardless of where or how your employees need access, LastPass ensures your employees have secure access to their work applications with SSO and password management. LastPass offers offline mode for both password management and multi-factor authentication so your employees can gain access no matter where they might be. Seamless collaboration with coworkers is essential when working remotely. LastPass enables remote employees to securely share passwords across teams in order to stay on top of critical projects. Intuitive admin and end user experience allow you to get up and running in minutes, not days. LastPass has a globally dispersed, ready to respond support and success team to aid with an efficient LastPass deployment. 
LastPass enables IT teams to remain in complete control over which employees are accessing which resources, no matter where they are working, for unified visibility over access and authentication. Increased security doesn't have to be complex. Start your journey today by visiting lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. It's lastpass.com slash T-W-I-T. And we thank LastPass for their sponsorship of Floss Weekly. So, Jonathan, once you get to start, take the, uh, the, first, uh, well, the first interesting article that you want to read. Sure. Let's take a look at GitHub. Um, so, obviously, Microsoft back, how long has it been now, a year, two years ago, uh, bought GitHub and kind of everybody in the open source world went, oh, no, our favorite tool is going to go away. And uh, it's been interesting to watch what's happened. But here in just the last few days, uh, they they rolled out a change at GitHub that uh, you get more for free. And the way they put it is they're no longer charging for privacy. They are simply charging for features now. Yeah, I saw that. It was like so it used to be I think when I first signed up for GitHub, they gave you one private repo for free. And now it's sort of uh, unlimited with, un- with nearly unlimited collaborators. I mean, well, if you have more than 200 friends, I guess, no, but – or whatever it is, 2,000? What's, what's the upper limit? It's just something big. I, I think they hmm, they may have got, gone away to altogether with the collaboration limit too. I, I don't remember. Uh, it's, it's interesting though to note that uh, what's the – what is the um, – what's the result going to be of making these private repos available to everybody? You think about it, and one of the things about GitHub is it's it's such a useful tool. People want to use it, but by default, if you don't pay for it, you've, you're kind of funneled into the open source model. And now, if you can, if just anybody can use a private repo on GitHub, is it going to make? Uh, I don't know. Is it going to make just a little bit of a dent in how many of the GitHub repos are open source? Uh, yeah, I, I well, I think it is still going to be the, the 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 watering hole. I think it's still going to be the place where people are going to stick things because, you know, there's. There's GitHub itself, which is, you know, Git has issues and has pull requests and has the CICD stuff um, and all that sort of stuff. I think it's still going to be the, the, the center of uh, attention. It's still going to be, the, like I said, the watering hole. Uh, but you're right. There, there, there's an interesting point. If, if, if I can have a private repo there, um, was well, anything really private these days? I mean, it just means Microsoft can see it. <laughs> Maybe they'll just start stealing <laughs> stuff from people. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and and what what do we, uh, Dan's got an interesting point in the chat room. What what is the what is the incentive for Microsoft to offer this sort of service? Oh, yeah. So I was sorry. I was just wondering who we we're going to throw to there. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I, I'm curious about. Obviously, GitHub is is massive, as you say, and and everyone is on there, uh, or everyone seems to be on there. But um, it, it, it's a strange one. And when Microsoft bought GitHub, Jonathan's quite right. There were a lot of people who were very worried uh, in in the open source world, in the free, certainly in the free software world, uh, because you know we were. Lots of people were saying, oh, no, the evil overlords have come in. But I think it's a bit unfair, really, to, to say that about Microsoft these days. I'll get people emailing me about that, I'm sure. Uh, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. It's about adoption, I think, for me, is, is the big thing. I mean, we've seen with, with – I'm sure you guys probably know more people than I do who work at Microsoft. But from the people that I – the limited people that I do know, a few people that I know work at Microsoft, they tell me the culture has changed massively in the last um, – Oh, a few years since uh, since the change in management, and they seem and, to and, pour... Sorry, go on. Oh yeah, I was just going to say. Well, this is such mm-hmm. a, an amazing switch. I like to uh, benchmark this against the um, the Halloween memo, where they were trying uh. to embrace and extend and kill open source, and now we have things that are wonderful that I, I use every day. VS Code, which is completely open source, uh, completely being done in the public, um, and 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 now GitHub. Making this change, um, it's clear Microsoft em- em- embraced and extended open source in the sense that uh, they're now fully for it. Are you saying this because there was a management change? I'm not aware of that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's it, yeah. I know. I, was, I guess you're being facetious there, Randall. But yeah, there was a change of uh, CEO when Steve Barmer left, wasn't there? And, and then uh, 
and then yeah, there, there was a big kind of change there with with attitude. I think he he had a very serious problem with with Linux, particularly. We all remember the Linux is a cancer um, right. thing. So some people remember that very. <laughs> so and and the Halloween memo and all that that you mentioned, um, yeah. which is interesting. But I, from some of the people I know who work there, who are actually very staunch um, free software advocates, and and you know push the whole free software as in FSF side of that. Um, and they now, a couple of them I know work for Microsoft, which is almost unbelievable, really, because I, I was quite shocked. But they tell me that the culture's really changed and that they, they really push in. Um, so I think something like 100 of the top open source developers in the world were hired in the last couple of years by Microsoft. Or certainly, I don't know how you quantify that, but that's what people are saying. So they're really pushing for that more kind of Google-ish model of where you can work on your own project some of the time and you can your wow. open source project some of the time and you can work on... Well, you work on what they tell you to work on, I assume, the rest of the time. Uh, but you're right, VS Code is a big one. But I have a very quick question for both of you guys, actually, related to this. Um, sure. What's something that made GitHub controversial was the fact that it's not in itself open source. The GitHub um, software itself is, is proprietary. And um, I know that upsets quite a lot of free software people. Do either of you two use GitLab? And what are your thoughts on GitLab? I think they're a former guest on the show, so... I'm going to ask Jonathan first, seeing as, uh, seeing as you, you're okay. next to me in the in the video. <laughs> right. Um, I, I do I do understand the concern, and you know it'd be nice if GitHub were to open more of their stuff. Um, at the same time, I'm not quite a how should I put this a I'm more of a pragmatist when it comes to code, so I, it doesn't horribly bother me to use GitHub. Now that said, I do have a GitLab instance that I host. Um, a good friend of mine, I think, did all this, most of the setup on it, and then we we host some things together. Uh, and and so I do have a, a GitLab as well, and I I think it is important to have alternatives, particularly fully open source alternatives. Um, so if you know a week from now Microsoft makes a change and it just GitHub becomes odious. Well, it's it's not that big of a deal to go spin up a GitLab instance and just move everything over, and that's that's obviously important. But I, yeah, I, I use GitHub, and I don't I don't have a problem with it. Yeah, and uh, at my former client, uh, ZipRecruiter, who let uh, 500 people go a few weeks ago, well, me being one of them, so I'm currently in between gigs. Anybody use that as a cue? I'll probably say it again at the end of the show. Uh, we use GitLab, but we use the um, we had the, a commercially supported version of it, so we had uh, access to support people if uh, things were breaking, um, and also uh, you know, bleeding edge um, uh, patches, things like that. Um, I have set up personally a couple of Gitto Lite instances, and I think I was trying to get the Gitto Lite guy on, but he's on, he's in uh, far eastern Europe time, and he just couldn't find a good time that we could uh, chat together. Um, but Gitto Lite has an amazing. Uh, amazing uh, bunch of uh, features that I haven't seen anywhere else. You can restrict who can push to a branch based on group membership. So you basically can set up groups and you could say that only this team can access this branch. And it's, it's, uh, it was quite clever for what it was doing. And it was funny. It was, it was, uh, part of it was in Perl. Part of it was in, uh, uh bash, I think. So it was uh, it was really really well done. Um, I would be happy to set up another set, and it's fully open source. So check it out. Git O Light G I T letter O L I T E. Uh, there's probably a website that has that name in it somewhere. Um, but uh, but yeah, well, you, like I said, we use GitLab at, uh, at ZipRecruiter. Uh, well, they now still probably use it, but uh, I'm not there anymore. <laughs> um, anyway, um, yeah, this, this is this is going to be interesting how this goes forward. Um, you know, will there be more shared repos with, uh, and I think Jonathan just said ultimate, um, uh, unlimited cl contributors. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I, it wasn't a number there, which is great. Um, yeah. So cool. Um, uh, anything more on that or can we move on to the next story? Um, well, very quickly, I was just going to say there's a few things that I – this shows my – people won't be shocked at this. shows my ignorance when it comes to GitHub and, and Git, I suppose. But I, I quite recently in the last year attended a, a, like a training session on, on Git and GitHub, and I never realized that some of the features I thought were part of Git itself were actually part of GitHub. So I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that. I mean, sure, developers probably do, people who are more – uh, active developers than I am, but things like pull requests, all of that whole kind of thing is all from 
GitHub. Uh, that's just the thing that GitHub in, it built into their software, which is the proprietary part. And I don't want to bang the drum too much about that because I've already mentioned that it's proprietary. And actually, I didn't answer my own question. I don't have a huge problem with that myself. I think if the tool works, <laughs> then then great. You know, I just so Jonathan doesn't feel like he's on his own there. Uh, so uh, we both, yeah, we both made the same point. But anyway, I was just going to mention it. It's interesting that. Um, some of these things which are part of GitHub and not part of, of Git, I didn't realize quite how many of those there were. Yeah, well, the, the primary thing about Git is it's the change control system. But GitO, GitHub has all these other things, uh, pull requests, um, uh, issue trackers, uh, activity monitors, things like that that are really, really useful. Um, I know that anytime we have a, a, a guest and they're t uh, talking about their um, their appearance on uh, GitHub, uh, especially if Simon's on, uh, we go look at the activity tracker and see if it's just a, a one-man band or whether it's actually a group of, of people and outside collaborators, things like that. So GitHub is great. It's uh, it's really, really cool. Oh, by the way, the Andromeda in, in the uh, chat room says it is gitolite.com. So go check that out. Uh, definitely recommend it if you want an uh, amazing amount of detailed control over who can push to what branches and uh, triggering things. It has hooks for all the stuff when you push. So it's uh, it's very, very clever. So I think I'm done with Git. Uh, you want to go to the next one there, Jonathan? Sure. And uh, the next thing that, that I came across my radar is John Conway died just a few days ago. And for those that don't know, Conway, mathematician, um, came up with uh, some really, really fascinating theoretical things. But uh, John Conway created the game of life. And, of course, that's been a kind of a staple of the open source world for 50 years now and uh, passed away, I think, on the 11th, something like that. But uh, just sad to see that. And died of COVID, too, which is um, sad. Yes. So uh, on um, XKCD, there was a, yes. a, a there was a little comic and it's it's poignant, but it's also amazing. It's the stick figure, but then it dissolves into the game of life and you've got one of the little flyers kind of gliders. fades off into the corner and goes away. Gliders, yes. Uh, goes off into the corner and disappears. And I thought, just what a what a neat send-off. Now, since I'm probably the oldest or second oldest person here, no, Dan's not very old, so I I actually remember <laughs> the original uh, John Conway article in uh, Scientific American. And I remember making graph paper and, and making dots and, and sort of doing this manually. And it was really, really... Uh, enlightening because there was all these things that they were creating. And when they ended up with, um, I mean, it's been studied now for 15 years, 15, 50 years, which makes me really old. Um, I'm 58. <laughs> so it was, it was when I had, I actually won a subscription to Scientific American because of some math contest I competed in when I was that young. And so it was one of the very first magazines that I physically had, which was really amazing. And and it was one of the very first issues of that sequence that I had. Um, and I, I, I and then I've seen it over the years. I mean, I've seen it in, uh, I've seen, you know, websites are dedicated to it. You can, you know, draw the dots on the screen. You can, there's apps you can download to uh, run those. And, and but, but the, the, the thing that really gets to me was, you know, once they discovered the glider to see if there was ever going to be like a, uh, at, at end, endless loop, you know, the glider proved it. I mean, the glider self reproduces every, I think it's six cycles, four cycles, something like that. And, uh, and then they discover these much more complex thing. They discovered a glider gun. So this, this big, huge set of dots would come together and collide a bit and then pull back apart. And there was a glider. And so he basically could generate an infinite number of uh, gliders uh, with this uh, complex thing. And as I was uh, looking at the article here, um, uh, I saw that they also had a Turing machine built in <laughs> in, uh, in in life. And once mm -hmm. you can build a Turing machine, you can do anything, albeit quite slowly, I presume. Um, so it was uh, it was rather rather clever. Um, so I, I don't. Uh, I don't know if yes. it's for real, but there is a there is a video out there that purports to show Conway's Game of Life being emulated in Conway's Game of Life. I, I oh, don't know for man. sure that it's real, but it looks quite impressive. That is so meta. That is so meta. But <laughs> I, I imagine it is. It's uh, well, you know, anything 
anything that can do some computation can probably generate everything. You know, that's that's probably the way it works. Uh, and uh, if you're happy to be watching the video, we've got some examples of stuff coming up on the screen. Um, is this the glider gun? Kind of looks like it. Um, I it is. Yep. Good. Mm -hmm. Glider gun. I've just been whispered in my ear that this is the glider gun. Um, so uh, this is one of those shows where you'll probably want to go look at the video at least at least at, at uh, you know uh, 15 minutes. Of, oh man, we're already 15 minutes into the show. I guess we better get, get on to the next couple of articles. We're just going to never get all the way through. Uh, anything else on uh, John Conway? Yeah, just, just no, sad no. news. Very sad news. Yeah, very sad news. Well, you know, we're all just one heartbeat away. I mean, that's that's the mm -hmm. truth about life. So. Uh, you know, my time will come as well. Uh, hopefully, hopefully not before I get home tomorrow. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Uh, next one, Jonathan. QT, uh, QT, the makers of, uh, of KDE and the QT library, um, in the midst of COVID-19, they have announced that they are looking at going a 12 month release cycle where they release uh, their, their next version of their library to paying customers, and then 12 months later, it gets released as open source to everybody else. And no, mm -hmm. people are not happy about this. In fact, there is a, there's already a group of people that are kind of uh, putting their heads together and thinking about forking the whole, the whole QT system and uh, doing a more open version of it. But time, time will tell what happens with that. So what do you think mm -hmm. their motivation is here, just um, trying to raise money in an uncertain economy? I'm sure that's a big part of it. QT has always had this kind of strange, uh, strange model where they they do this. They have you know their release goes out to paying customers, and then some amount of time later, it goes out to everybody as open source. Um, so that's always been a little strange, uh, if, if I remember correctly. I'm I'm working off the top of my head here, but uh, so that's that's always been a little odd. But yeah, I, I think just with. Uh, you know, the, the uncertainty and, and financial pressures, they're kind of scrambling to try to come up with all well, the way the rest of us are trying to come up with how to pay the bills. Now, for those of us that are on the Mac side of this, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, weren't they also owned by Nokia at one time? They had a whole thing where Nokia bought them. And uh, we all know that things didn't go great for, for Nokia in the last <laughs> few years. Uh, so I think they had some, I think they had some issues there. They're very, it's good that you call it QT, Jonathan, because so do I, but people tell me you're supposed to say cute. I, I don't think that's, well, very cute. Let's be honest. Uh, it just doesn't, <laughs> it just doesn't seem to really work for me. Sorry, Randall, carry on. No, no, I was just, I was, I was actually just going to say coming from the Mac side of things and not being very familiar with Linux, I believe KDE is like the the desktop environment. It's sort of like the thing that manages the windows on your screen and and uh, the, the the shortcuts and things like that. How does uh, QT fit into that? So QT is a, basically a library, a graphics library, um, and it runs on. I'm pretty sure it runs on Mac and on Windows, on Linux. Uh, runs on mobile platforms as well. So interestingly, why why Nokia bought QT back in the day is Nokia was doing their their Linux phones back before Android was really much of a thing. They had the, the Nokia okay. N900 was a, a really cool handset. And so they were they were trying to do a, a QT, Qt uh, based phone at the time. Um, but so Qt is this, uh, this kind of this interconnection library that, you know, lets you run, write code once and it makes the graphics look right wherever you go. Well, they've built KDE, a desktop environment on top of the, the, QT libraries. And so okay. these, these two projects are kind of interconnected. And so there's a lot of people that work on both of them. Um, and I, I think the, um, I think a lot of the, the KDE direction comes from, uh, comes from some of the QT guys. Um, but they, they now have a separate foundation that, that runs KDE, but these two projects, they kind of came out of the same idea and they're, they're in some ways joined at the hip. And just to bring another Nokia relevance into this, uh, I remember when we had Richard Hip on the show talking about SQLite, he said uh, he was actually being paid by Nokia as, uh, as sort of his uh, full-time, uh, what do you call it, a benefactor, a sponsor, <laughs> um, something like that, where he gets paid hey. to work on Nokia stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the reason he was being paid by Nokia is that Nokia's phones didn't actually have a file system. They just had a giant SQLite instance, and all your data was inside SQLite. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, that's interesting. That that's cool. how yeah. a lot of it. 
that's pretty much how Android apps work too. Uh, as much of the data as you can, use stuff into an SQLite uh, database, and that's where most everything lives. <laughs> well, it's like S- mm-hmm. SQLite is actually in every modern smart device. Um, you know, it's it's, mm-hmm. it's sort of the core of some part of uh, the Mac OS uh, storage area. It's part of the iPhone storage area, and it's funny because I, I keep seeing MySQL touting themselves as the most widely installed. <laughs> database. And I said, no, you're not even close to SQLite. <laughs> you're not, you're yeah. like an order of magnitude fewer devices than SQLite. So uh, I, I, I irritated my, my SQL for doing that. I've, I've seen SQLite on, on embedded systems. So yeah. I don't see, you're never going to get MySQL or my, you know, any of those MariaDB or any of those derivatives onto an embedded device. So not that I, I would think anyway. Well, SQLite also has the feature. Uh, this is not an SQLite show, so I shouldn't keep going on about this. But I remember this from the time we interviewed Richard Hip, who is just a very kind man, by the way. He is an amazing contributor to the world because of his work on SQLite. Um, but one of the things that makes SQLite special is that it's one of the few databases that's certified by the Department of Defense to be used in uh, like military grade. Uh, systems like like uh, plane control and things like that, and it's because he paid so much attention to every single detail, and then he, he went through the uh, the DoD review process, and so SQLite is is certainly going to be there better earlier than MySQL is ever going to be, even Postgres probably. Although uh, it, it's funny when uh, I saw an, uh, a keynote that uh, uh, Richard Hip did at a Postgres conference. And he says, uh, whenever I'm writing something for SQLite, I'm trying to do it according to the standards, which are really opaque, the SQL standards. I just look and say, what does Postgres do? Because <laughs> Postgres is so <laughs> accurate. You know, they're, they're even, mm. uh, they, they implement the, the standard so much better. So SQLite emulates Postgres in uh, pretty much every way, shape, and form, except for having uh, non-typed columns. So pretty cool. All right, enough on that. Unless there's anything else on QT and KDE, any any last tickers there? There's 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 one more footnote here that's interesting to know sure. about. Um, apparently, there's an agreement in place between the KDE Foundation and the Qt company that uh, should the QT free edition no longer be de- developed under the required licenses, whatever that means, then yeah. the foundation has the right to release QT under a BSD style license or other open source licenses. Ooh. And so if if things go real bad, there is a uh, there's an escape clause there that basically says, yes, the KDE foundation has the right to, to hard fork this if they feel like they need to. So that that's that's interesting. I, I feel like kudos should be given to whoever pushed to get that, you know, inserted into the legal agreement. Um, but that, that's that's interesting to note. Interesting. Cool. I, I, are you guys familiar with sunset clauses at all? It's something that I've um, I've been well, I've been finding out a lot about recently. There's a new movement to uh, as you we talked about open source. It fits in with you know the licensing thing that that, that uh, Jonathan's just mentioned. In that we're seeing a lot of things now where people want to have a um, a license that that is proprietary and then later on through some timing device becomes open source, which is a, a, an interesting one, uh, which is what you just mentioned. I've seen it the other way around as well, where uh, people, uh, you know, want to have a, a copy left. Uh, you know, they want to have a copy left so, uh, a clause on their license. So they want to be able to use a version of, say, the GPL, which we all know. And I was going to say know and love. Let's just say we all know. I, I love it. <laughs> um, but Sorry, I can't resist that. But uh, yeah, so uh, basically a sunset clause, which I'm over explaining, is a thing where uh, after a certain illegal device, after a certain amount of time, where um, the, the license... But when when the last contribution goes out of copyright, you can actually you can well, not within the full term of copyright. You can say this is copyright for say five years, and then after those five years, it will uh, it will become you know people can then put it under whatever license they want. Effectively, it becomes public domain, which is quite interesting. Wow. I just I've never seen any software under that yet, but it's something that uh, some people I know are promoting because they don't actually see copyright. And copy left because it's based on copyright as a necessarily a good thing in perpetuity. In, 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 what's the word? In perpetuity. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah, and I know for some people, copy left is the uh, is a poison pill. They 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 can't bring it into their organization because it might taint the rest of their software. And uh, mm-hmm. I agree. That's why I prefer you know MIT style BSD style licenses because 
it basically gives everybody the same rights, not just the first owner have some rights that nobody else has. Um, that's, 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 people say, well, everybody gets the same rights. No, the original owner mm. the, whose name is on the copyright statement, that ha he has a, he or she has a completely different relationship to the software because he or she can decide then what further license goes on it. And if he, if they attach, uh, like the GPL, yes, everybody after that has roughly the same rights. But the first person always has special rights, and and that's that's uh, unbalanced. BSD, everybody has the same rights. The next guy down the line can uh, you know lock up some of it or use it in a proprietary software, a closer software. Uh, so everybody has the same rights, which is pretty amazing. So anyway, uh, I could rant about that. We could do a whole show on licenses. I think I have done two or three shows only on licenses. So uh, we've got a lot more topics. Man, we're only like a, a third of the way down our list, and we're already uh, midway through the show. So um, what's next there, Jonathan? Uh, sure. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about Fedora and Rel over on the Red Hat side of things. Um, Fedora 33 has something they're calling Enterprise Linux Next, which is essentially a CentOS, no, excuse me, uh, Enterprise Linux, RHEL, being developed out in the open now. Uh, one of the one of the interesting things to watch is uh, Red Hat has historically, when they've worked on their next version of Enterprise Linux, it's kind of been siloed and they've done it all internally. And they finally, they say, okay, it's done now and they do the release uh, and then you know, everybody gets gets access to it. You can you can buy it, and then CentOS starts their process of repackaging. Uh, it it looks like with Fedora 33, they're actually going to um, do an open fork of Fedora 33 and start working on the next version of RHEL out in the open, which I thought was really interesting. Wow, and RHEL is uh, RHEL is fairly popular in the business world, I believe, right? Yes, yeah. business world. Uh, you also see, at least in the United States, you see it a lot in the government and the military world too. Um, it's it's used in quite a few weapon systems in different places like that. Now, this is interesting that they're developing rail in sort of the open, but isn't isn't that what Fedora's job is? Or am I confusing things? So yeah. the way it works is Fedora is their their rapid release, bleeding edge. You know, we're going to release with the absolute newest kernel available. And they do that every what, six months, nine months, something like that. And then so what they do then is they take one of those releases of, of uh, Fedora. And after, you know, the next one comes out, there's a group of engineers that keep working on that release. And they, you know, they they backport security fixes. They do lots and lots of uh, stability testing, hardware testing on it. And that edition of Fedora, as it evolves, kind of snapshot it in a way. But as it evolves okay. towards more and more stable, that eventually becomes uh, the next version of Enterprise Linux. It's like okay. Debian, isn't it, in a way? I think that's the, the kind of the comparison that well, I, I don't know. I'm using Debian as an example as if everybody understands the Debian model. Well, sorry, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> Basically, um, yeah, the whole thing is very confusing when it comes to Red Hat's relationship with now CentOS, which they own, uh, which they didn't originally. But anyway, the, the Debian model is basically you have a rolling unstable release, which they do have mm -hmm. in Fedora. They have a thing called Rawhide, which is yes. just like changes. It's like Arch Linux. It changes every day uh, near so enough. And you can Isn't run Rawhide. I've, I've tried sorry. it, but it's very unstable. Isn't Debian the upstream from Ubuntu, or am I getting that confused? You know, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, okay. Debian is the upstream <laughs> from Ubuntu. So basically, the the, 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 the you know the, how confusing do we want to get? <laughs> no, that's not, that's not worry about it. <laughs> let's stick with let's stick with the Red Hat side of it for now. Um, so yeah, basically, what they do it, the reason I related it to Debian is because at some point Debian decide a point in this rolling release where they go, we're going to freeze it here, and we're going to take like a snapshot. And then we're going to make that into a releasable, stable version. And we'll stop adding new things and we'll make the things that are in there stable and working. And then we'll release it. Now, in Debian's case, that often takes like years because they spend a long time stabilizing things. Uh, in the enterprise world, I think they often it's similar because they need things that are absolutely tested and bulletproof. Whereas your desktop users who are used to things like, say, Arch Linux want the latest thing now and they don't particularly care if it breaks as long as it's the latest, greatest thing. So there's always that trade off. But um, the interesting thing with, with Fedora is that like, it seems as though there's no real place for CentOS anymore because the whole 
whole point of CentOS used to be you could get an unbranded version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux where you didn't have to pay for the license and the support contract, but you could still get the exact same software with the badges removed and so on, which was exactly what CentOS was and what it purported to be. But now, since Red Hat bought CentOS as well, I don't really see the need for it. Maybe from what Jonathan's just described, it sounds as though they're almost saying, let's just do away with the whole CentOS thing and just have, you know, Fedora go straight into, into RHEL. And then, um, we, you know, we you can get a version of RHEL, which we're now not calling CentOS anymore. I don't know. It's, it's all very confusing. If, if you can't tell, I'm as confused as you are. Okay. You know, you know but so, I tell you what, it, I've learned more about Linux in the last uh, 30 minutes than I've known for like most of my <laughs> life. So this is already pretty cool. Um, like I said, I'm not a Linux guy. I don't run Linux on anything. Um, uh, and I have, uh, I'm using uh, FreeBSD in my, for the cloud and I'm running Mac OS on my uh, laptop and things like that. So I don't really know much about Linux. And it, it irritates y'all, I know. <laughs> it's like, why aren't you running Linux? And I went, well, no, because at the end of the day, this thing's going to talk to my uh, my iPhone. And I don't know that we can do that really well with Linux. So, you know, it's a kind of a not, crazy way. Uh, anything more on this? Do you not have any embedded on? devices? Sorry, Randall, I'm interrupting you. But do you not have any embedded devices or anything? I, I think somewhere in your house, I would like to bet money, or not in your house, in your in your collection of kit, there may be a Linux kernel on something, but I don't know. Oh, yes, there is. I have the uh, L16 uh, camera where it has 16 lenses and it merges the picture together to give a depth of field and all sorts of really cool stuff. Although uh, the battery's not replaceable and eventually it's going to die and they basically stop making them. So, uh, But at one point, it, it's running Android because at one point I actually uh, enabled uh, the Android debug mode on it and downloaded an app from uh, Flutter, so I was actually had a Flutter app on my uh, on my on my camera, <laughs> which was pretty strange. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. But when you do that, the synchronization software that puts the soft or puts the images up onto the laptop uh, breaks. So I have to turn it back off in order to be able actually to. Uh, to uh, do that. Uh, now I'm rambling, but uh, Jonathan says he wants a little <laughs> bit more about CentOS. So go, John. Yeah, so uh, Dan Dan asked a question. I think it's interesting, and we're talking about what the point of CentOS is. And I would I would say that there is still quite a point to CentOS because you know all the stuff that we've talked about with uh, with Fedora and and all of that. It's it's either going to be very bleeding edge changes really often or is still under active development, right? So all, all of this stuff that we've talked about with Enterprise Linux Next and, and the Fedora releases, um, they're, they're just rapid as fast as they can making changes to it. And there is there is definitely a place for I need a Linux distro that doesn't change. We get security updates, but we're not constantly mm -hmm. going to the, the most recent kernel. We're not constantly, you know, upgrading our PHP version. We're not constantly upgrading to the, you know, the next version of the desktop, uh, um, the desktop software. Right. But right. there is, there, there are a lot of people that, you know, don't want to run a full rel system for whatever reason. They don't want to pay for it. They don't need the support or what have you. And so I think there is absolutely still a place for CentOS. In fact, I, I run CentOS myself on quite a few boxes um, and it's, it's super nice to have. It's, it's a, it's a really great project. Hmm. It it is a really good project. So um, I, I I agree. Um, you're right. Actually, I hadn't thought about that. So it's it's still going to be unstable. Very quickly, um, a very quick kind of anecdotal point. When I was years ago in in um, in Germany for a Linux tag, which is a big event they have over there, I was chatting to the the head of uh, some of the people who run the kind of Red Hat support. Uh, you know, their legendary Red Hat support section. And I asked them about CentOS because at the time they, they didn't own it and it seemed to be competing with them. And they told me that, um, I, and this is, this is, as I say, anecdotal, they were telling me at the time that they actually really liked Cent CentOS or CentOS because it got people onto Red Hat and then they could, basically by adding about two or three packages, they could convert your system from CentOS to RHEL 
uh, and then they, they would support it after that. Now, I don't know. I'm not going to speak for Red Hat, obviously. I don't know if they still will do that. But it is mm. a good point that if you do want an enterprise system and you want to, ha- you don't have the money to pay for an enterprise support license, but you might have down the line, it might be worth using something like CentOS because then you can say, you know, I've suddenly been given a load of VC funding and I'm going to have to, you know, I want all the support you can give me. They're quite happy. They, they used to be certainly very happy to do that. And I imagine they probably still are. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a couple of topics I really want to get to, so I want to make sure we leave enough time for that. But uh, let's keep going down the list. Uh, the next one, we just talked about Fedora and Ubuntu. So how, how does that fit in with this next topic? Oh, right. So Fedora and Ubuntu are both about to uh, about to have another major release. Uh, Fedora 32 is about to come out, Ubuntu 20.04. I think they both have beta releases now. Um, and what's really interesting about this is, well, one thing, a project that we've interviewed in the past, WireGuard. It's finally landed in the Linux kernel. It's officially there. And uh, Fedora 32, as it is a bleeding edge release, is going to have the newest version of the kernel that has WireGuard in it. And then uh, Ubuntu 20.04, the, the Ubuntu devs are actually backporting WireGuard. So it's it's really interesting to see this project that I've followed for a long time that we've we've interviewed uh, Donafeld from WireGuard is finally going to be <clears throat> kind of by default installed in this next round of uh, kernel releases. Uh, and then there's a couple of other interesting things in in both Ubuntu and Fedora. They're they're both dropping Python two altogether, and um, in Ubuntu there is no longer a 32-bit Ubuntu distro. You can't even do an upgrade from the previous version of Ubuntu on a 32-bit machine. So uh, interesting changes. Cool. And uh, for those of us who didn't watch the WireGuard episode, uh, can you give me like the 30-second view? Uh, a modern VPN that uses really modern encryption and really, really simple configuration. Oh, cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Um, nice. Uh, that sounds like fun. Um, so, uh, Dan, any, anything on that? No, I, I mean, it, it's really good to see WireGuard actually uh, coming in there. And and it's, as Jonathan said, I, I haven't used it much myself yet, so I'm really keen to use it. The fact that it's going to end up in, uh, com, you know, very public kind of well-known distros will help me because that means I won't have to, you know, compile it or try and uh, add it into my own distro or so in some way. So it does look very interesting. I'm interested to see how it compares to OpenVPN because I do use OpenVPN a lot, but I know people hate the configuration. You have to do a very specific configuration dance that I think people find annoying and I do myself sometimes. So um, maybe I can learn to love WireGuard instead. So I'm just noticing in the chat room, Phoenix Warp One says, uh, "Hey guys, I uh, really like this. I like the news roundup style of show. I know you guys like guests all the time, but you guys talking about the news and new projects talking is pretty refreshing." So you know, uh, I tell you, we're going to use this sort of style if Jonathan's willing, because he seems to be <laughs> the one to come up with all the URLs. Uh, we're going to use this as the as 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 a backup when we do get guests canceling the last minute. We can't stop the shows. The shows have to keep going on because we have advertisers and they expect to be uh, the ads read. And so I can't cancel shows except very, very rarely when there's no ads. But we're, we're getting ads pretty much every week now. So, um, And I like that because it helps pay for the show. I mean, that's the important thing. Um, you know, back when I was doing the show without ads, uh, you know, Leo was essentially paying for this out of his pocket. And uh, I really appreciate that he carried me all those years. But uh, I'm really happy now that I can uh, help with a bit of the revenue for the Twit Network. Um, OK, I, like I said, I want to get through the rest of these uh, coming down. Uh, I don't really have anything else to say about WireGuard. Oh, but I, I'll second Dan's uh, thing. OpenVPN has just been amazing. I, I have uh, OpenVPN setups on a couple of the machines that I have to connect into. Um, and, uh, I, I, it, it's, it's a nice open standard. It runs on multiple platforms. Uh, uh, do you know if WireGuard runs on Mac OS? Yes. Yes, it does. And does they it also run on uh, FreeBSD? Uh, 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 per, pretty sh- I'm pretty sure it's in the FreeBSD kernel. So what, what they did with WireGuard is they, they have a C implementation that goes into the kernel. And then there's also a, Oh, I think it's in Go. It's either Go or Rust. I think it's in Go. They have a user space implementation that you can sure. run pretty much anywhere. Now, of course, the, the C version runs faster and lighter and all of that. Um, but, yeah, you, pretty much any platform you can imagine you can get WireGuard on now. 
Awesome. Awesome. Okay. We'll have to look into that a little bit more, but, uh, and I presume of course, uh, although it's not open VPN compatible, it's probably, uh, been, uh, evaluated by people smarter than me, <laughs> which is not hard. I'm, I'm kind of in the middle. So there's a lot of people smarter than me. That's kind of fun. <laughs> um, anyway, it's like, we, I do want to get to these last few topics before we uh, have to cut it out though. Uh, so what's this next one about, uh, uh CPAP? Uh, so it's kind of a, a a big topic with some little ones in it: coronavirus and open source. And one of the uh, so all of us all of us hackers are suddenly quarantined at home. We're stuck at home, and you know those of us that are really interested in open source, we're looking at coronavirus and going, how can we help? How can we bring our unique way of looking at the world to this? And there's been there's been some interesting stories with this. The first one is jailbreaking a CPAP to turn it into a ventilator. And so it's it's this story I picked it up off of ours, wow. and it's a it's about a, a CPAP, which is a uh, oh, I don't remember what it stands for, but it, it is a it is a device that helps someone with sleep apnea breathe overnight. Yes, constant positive air pressure. I was I was just told. Um, yes, yeah. it 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 allows someone. Basically, what it does is it blows air in the nose while someone is asleep to stop their airways from closing off with sleep apnea, which, you know, super helpful for those people that, that need it. And the manufacturer of this particular device said, well, maybe some of the parts in it could work for a full fledged ventilator, but it would take such a significant rework. It's just not worth it. And some, some hackers started digging around in the firmware and went, no, no guys, all you have to do is essentially put the thing in debug mode and look, there's settings right here for turning it into a ventilator. And so I just, wow. I thought it it was really interesting to see that there's this essentially a jailbreak that you do on this this CPAP machine, and suddenly you have a ventilator if you need one. Yeah, and with the shortage of ventilators, um, not in uh, not in any credit to uh, our current administration, it's this is be a great way to kind of repurpose uh, machines like that. I know that lots there's lots of CPAPs out there, um, so maybe uh, maybe we could uh, take advantage of this for people that are like that. Um, <laughs> Dan set his ventilator equals one. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Dan, Dan, anything to say about that? Uh, no, you're muted. It's amazing. Dan is there. We go. Oh, yep. Sorry, you're good now. Uh, I'm yeah. good now. Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to say it's a great story. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. And uh, and uh, but, I think the next story relates to that. There, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, the next story is a, a kind of a different take on this. It's a bunch of open source guys that got together and said, "Well, let's let's design our own ventilator." Uh, this one I picked up off a of Hackaday, and it's it's a super simple idea. You know, it's basically a mechanical pump that squeezes on an airbag, um, but it's 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 essentially what a, a hacker would do if he had a few minutes and some parts and needed to MacGyver together a ventilator to try to save somebody's device or some somebody's life. And uh, again, there there this this group of guys that are working and saying let's let's build one of these that will work and let's make the whole thing open source and make it simple so that you know wherever you are you can try to cobble together the parts to make one of these. Yeah, I like your reference to MacGyver because he, uh, MacGyver, of course, the TV series from the was that seventies? It's a while ago. Eighties. Um, eighties. <laughs> that was the eighties. 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 Right. Right. I know it preceded uh, Stargate One because at one point they actually mentioned MacGyver in like the fourth episode of Stargate One. Um, <laughs> very yeah, so they, they, they were talking. Yeah, they were. I mean, it, there's uh, RDA standing there, uh, Richard Dean Anderson, and uh, uh, whatever the the woman's name is, uh, forget what her Carter. Colonel. Colonel Carter. Right. She was yeah. talking about when they were trying to get one of the uh, dial home devices to work. Uh, she was talking about MacGyvering something together, and he was standing right there. It was pretty funny. Um, but no, this is this is an amazing use of creative talent, uh, and and a, a very practical use. I mean, it's uh, I'm not going to say that all of our software creation that we make is not practical, but but you know, this is this is life saving if if it works mm -hmm. and it can be distributed and it can be. Um, uh, used uh, in, in in ways that uh, um, you know that that would solve the problem. It, that's that sounds amazing. It's really really cool. Dan, you got anything on this? 
No, I mean, I, again, I feel like I'm just giving the same answer every time. But yeah, it, it sounds like an amazing story. I think that the thing that I would take from it is that he, uh, the ingenuity of, of hackers knows no bounds. We always find a way to, you know, jimmy something together that will, will do a job. And there's no better way to kind of describe that than the MacGyvering, if that's a verb, MacGyvering of something. Uh, we just now. That's it. Yeah, it is now. <laughs> It is now. It is now. All right. We're getting close to the end of the hour, so I'm going to have to uh, skip through this. Uh, what's the next one? Attempting uh, open sourcing a commercial design. Yes. So first off, let's let's hit on something real quick. Eric Duckman in the chat room just mentioned something. He says, and get FDA approval. And oh, yeah. yeah. Th that's, that's, well, that's an interesting point about all of this. So – um, we we kind of look at this from a we're in the United States perspective, and you know if you if you're going to use one of these devices, particularly in a hospital, it's got to be FDA approved, and you've got to sure. have this stamp on it. It's got to be manufactured correctly, and there's a reason that all of those things are the case. But that's in the United States. Um, if someone is you know in the middle of Africa or in the outback of Australia or you know the middle of Siberia. And you need something and you have internet access and you can pull these plans. You don't have to have FDA permission to be able to save somebody's life. Um, so there, there's kind of a, there's kind of a balance on this and, uh, we'll, we'll not get into any of the politics about this at all, but <laughs> there, there is, there is definitely a place for these kind of, um, Worst case scenario, this will work devices um, that maybe don't have much of a place in a city in the United States where there's, you know, there are going to be ventilators available, hopefully. Um, but God. there's there's a there's a bigger world out there than just, you know, Los Angeles and the United States. And so you, you do kind of have to keep that in mind when you talk about these things. I bet you it wouldn't need much approval in Mexico. You know, anything goes down here, so it's uh, pretty pretty crazy. Yeah, I imagine they could just start building them. Um, you know, there's actually a pretty big hacker community. Uh, Guillermo Amaral, uh, former uh, co-host of the show and passed away, unfortunately, a few years ago, um, uh, was part of a very large hacker community here, and especially um, like a physical hacker. So he did, made devices and things like that. And I bet if that team got a hold of these designs. I bet you, you know, Tijuana would be perfectly, perfectly uh, well su supplied for uh, ventilators. Although uh, the outbreak here is uh, less, which is why I've been. It's part of the reason I've been here for four weeks now, just to make sure that I mm -hmm. don't back, go back home too early to my uh, to Beaverton, Oregon, which unfortunately was apparently one of the hotbeds, which is what made the governor uh, actually put on the uh, shutdown. So I'm not looking forward. I, I'm actually just going to go home and order a lot of Uber Eats. That's pretty much it. So I might order takeout. I might actually go drive it on just to get out of the house every once in a while. But uh, that's a little risky. I'm going to get a mask before I do that. Anyway, I've uh, got a couple more items still, and we're getting down let's, to the wire. So Yeah, let's talk about Medtronix. Uh, so we've got okay. this big commercial company that makes, that makes all of this different equipment, Medtronix, and they have said, hey, we're going to take one of our designs for a ventilator and we're going to release it. Um, and the CEO of the company even made this, the statement that we're going to release it as open source. And when Hackaday covered it, they used this term open source. And uh, we got to looking at the the license and kind of the the regulations on how Medtronics is allowing you to use this and what all got released. And um, it's not open source. <laughs> so oh, we talked about no. Sunset. Uh, yeah, so we talked about Sunset clauses. Uh, get this, in four years or whenever the COVID-19 pandemic ceases, uh, you lose all rights granted by the license to this thing. Whoa. <laughs> How's that for a Sunset clause? And who officially decides when the pandemic is over? That's uh, well, I mean, that's trigger the license. That's the a, legal team. Yeah. The legal, yeah, legal yeah, team at the company, probably. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, there, there's been kind of this big back and forth about, well, are these guys really are they acting um, out of ignorance, but good intentions? Or is this just a big publicity stunt? And uh, I, I don't I don't know that there was some there was some interesting and useful documentation that got released. But uh, I just it's a it's a it's kind of a lesson in how not to do this. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. That's uh that's open source and name only. I mean, we've had uh, companies do that, uh, to, uh, get publicity and get, uh, 
and get uh, you know uh, favorable reviews from uh, from various people in the open source community. But unless it's actually open source, it's not open source. You know, if it's not something that uh, that uh, Simon Phipps and his team approved of at o- OSI, then uh, it's it's not there. I know Simon's not at OSI anymore. Well, I think he's still like related to something. He's on some committee there. He's just not on the board anymore. So he's not here to defend himself. So I probably should stop talking about that. Anything you understand? <laughs> uh, no, I was just, you, you distracted me there thinking about the board of the MSI and how they would deal with this. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting one. It, it's the, it's the whole sunset clause thing. This seems to be the whole, um, what's the, like the buzz, buzzword, buzz kind of phrase at the moment which is all to do with copyright and patents and all these sorts of things people want to put a time-based thing into it although interestingly um something that we didn't really get to when i mentioned quickly about sunset uh, clauses in return in regard sorry to uh open source things becoming public domain something that i realized i found out later was that um as long as the software is actively developed the license cannot be revoked or, or the copyright is is then reset so the clock gets reset so if i say i've got a piece of software and i'm going to put a five-year sunset clause on it that that control you know that it's copyright for five years or it's whatever not copyright until after five years uh, then that every time somebody contributes something new it resets the, the time and legally apparently that's how that works so maybe there's a way we can hack these guys at their own game by adding new yeah. stuff and as long as we keep adding stuff <laughs> Like like changing the white space or something, I don't know. Then maybe we can keep resetting that clock, and they'll never quite be able to proprietize it again. I don't know. They'll have to accept <laughs> the pull request, though. But it, and it also could be a specific date rather than five years from now. So mm-hmm. and that would definitely uh, be something that wouldn't change based on uh, pull requests and uh, and patches. So it could be something like that. Uh, I hate to be depressing, but that's it. <laughs> I think that's probably accurate there. Okay, one last story, and then we're out of here. So I've got uh, some, of course, uh, upcoming guests to talk about. But uh, what's that last uh, printing PPE, personal P Personal protection equipment. Oh. Personal protection oh. equipment. Yes. So we're we're still on the, the COVID-19 train and kind of the open source train. And, uh, yep. you know, people have been looking at this. And one of the things they've been asking is, I've got a 3D printer. How can I help? And, well, a ventilator is a little too complex to print with a 3D printer. Um, sure. But there is a group of hackers that have put together a printable design for a face shield. Uh, and really what it is, is it's the, it's the headband and the holder for the piece of plastic. Um, but this particular design... It's it's open sourced and uh, it's been worked on and perfected and then actually submitted to NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and approved for official use. So this is a 3D printable um, personal protection equipment, the face shield that is actually approved for use in hospitals. Uh, so wow. you know if you're in a if you're in a place where you've got a group of medical professionals that need something like this and you've got a 3d printer there is actually an opportunity to be super helpful to some people cool and uh, mm. dan you have something about producing it in liverpool yeah so i know some people who are doing this um actually you know directly uh, involved in in doing this i don't think it's the set they didn't make the design but they're actually producing these visors these ppe visors for um for people in in the nhs and they've raised ten thousand pounds over crowdfunding uh, wow. to help with distribution. So there's a real kind of public will for this to work. Interestingly, mm-hmm. very quickly, Jonathan mentioned about regulations and, and different jurisdictions and the FDA and all that. And when, when this design first came out, it was only, it wasn't ratified, or it wasn't certified for use within the UK. So people were producing them and then sending them to places like Spain where they were allowed to use them. But now I believe mm-hmm. that we, we're using them in, in this country as well. Wow, cool, cool. Well, this has been an interesting show. A lot of stuff on uh, COVID, but uh, you know that's kind of the big topic these days. Almost every show <laughs> on the Twit Network ends up being this week in uh, this week in viruses. So um, it's uh, this is no exception to that. Jonathan, thank you for the list of topics and uh, bringing this all together and describing them to us. And Dan, thank you for uh, being on the show, being uh, uh, another counterpoint for some of this stuff. Uh, let me go through the uh, closing of the show here so we can uh, get out of here. Um, we got uh, coming up next week, uh, XCPNG, which is a turnkey open source hypervisor. So think of things like, uh, I'm trying to think of what is hypervisors like, uh, oh man, drawing a blank, drawing a blank. Uh, uh, Jonathan, hypervisor? Zen. 
Zen server Zen. is uh, one like of the Zen. big ones. Like Zen. Okay, mm-hmm. so we'll see that. Uh, contractor, which is a builder of anything. Well, that's what they claim, but it turns out it's only Python apps. And it's targeted to be used as a generic API to create, destroy, manipulate your resources, no matter what or where they are, as long as they are Python. This enables you to focus on what you want to make and not have to worry about the details and differences in deployment. Uh, following that, Presto. Presto is a high-performance... Oh, I'm excited by this show. Presto is a high-performance distributed SQL query engine for big data. So what's really cool about this is distributed. So that means you can have multiple nodes that are all computing some part of the thing, doing all their own sharding and everything that way. But more than that, they can look at a Postgres database. They can look at a MySQL database. They can look at S3, uh, all sorts of different backends, and they integrate all that. So I am really looking forward to Presto. I am really, really looking forward to that. Uh, Net data, inst- after that, instantly diagnose slowdowns and anomalies in your infrastructure with thousands of metrics, interactive visualizations, and insightful health alarms. There's a, quite a few players in that space because it's an important thing. So we'll see how this one is different from all that. If you go to the big uh, homepage for the show, which is twit.tv slash floss, you can see linked from there the big spreadsheet of who we're working on and who we're constantly slotting in and also get the actual dates of all the shows I just mentioned. If you have any other suggestions, please tell the project leader or community coordinator to email me. Um, I have uh, – oh, wait, forgot. Blockchain. Just had to say it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> it's a uh, – Drink. That's it. That's the drinking game. All right. Uh, I forgot to do that. Um, uh, we have a live stream at uh, 9 30 a.m. Oh, by the way, I, I'm I'm running out of shows again. So if you've got somebody that wants to be on, they can get on within five weeks. So please uh, do that. We'll probably get the one that was supposed to be today on in four weeks from now. So, uh, But uh, I'll open up some new dates uh, later today probably uh, and get some new question marks in that first column for uh, being able to put some more questions. Uh, guests in. We have a live stream at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays at live.twit.tv. We had some questions from there and we had some comments from there, so we took those and brought them into the show. You can follow us at at Floss Weekly on Twitter. You can follow me at at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N on Twitter. You can also join us, and this is probably the best way to have a dialogue with us, at uh, twit.community. There is a uh, specific uh, channel, or I don't know what they call it, but uh, specifically for Floss Weekly, and there's a new thread posted for every new show, so that's there. Uh, I want to plug first, and I'll let you guys plug some stuff. I want to plug um, that I am between gigs. I've got three leads that I'm working, but nothing has said yes yet. Uh, I've got enough money for about one more month. Uh, I got my uh, uh, coronavirus uh, check today, which was nice. Um, and I'm going to be applying for a small business loan um, based on the fact that I am a small business, which is affected by the coronavirus. And um, we'll see how long that takes to get some actual funding for that. Um, anyway, um, that's uh, so uh, I'm looking for mostly Pearl work because I'm I, I, I'm much easier to sell in Pearl than I am in uh, Flutter right now. And uh, and remote, obviously remote is, is the key word these days. It was funny because I got a pitch and somebody said uh, it'll be two weeks on site. And I go, I think this pitch was written before the coronavirus. And they said, <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's fine. It'll all be remote. Don't worry about it. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so I might get some remote work from that and it would be in Pearl, which would be really fun. Um, uh, uh, Jonathan, anything you want to plug? Uh, so I'll, I'll just mention what I normally mentioned. We kind of plugged it during the show today. Uh, go check my workout on Hackaday.com. Every Friday morning, I do a security roundup. We sneak a little open source news in there as well, just like we occasionally sneak some security news here into Floss Weekly. Uh, but every Friday morning, go check that uh, the security uh, This Week in Security column out. Cool. And Dan? Yeah, I very quickly want to plug. Um, the, the, in fact, the thing that I just mentioned before, the, the Visor pr- uh, project is from uh, my local hack space, which is Does Liverpool. So if you go to ppe.doesliverpool.com, that's their website where you can find out how to help out by donating even materials. If you've got materials they can use and you can get them to them, uh, then they're happy to do that as well. So please have a look at that. Cool, cool. Well, guys, it's been great. Um like I said, I don't want to do this like every week, but uh, it is nice to be able to do this like once a month or so to kind of do a roundup. 
And uh, it's especially nice to be able to fall back to this when uh, when we've screwed up. Hopefully, well, Jonathan, you're almost always available, so it's not too bad. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you and your availability is just uh, you're, you're like the uh, well, you're the the second most frequent uh, co-host. Well, no, you're the most frequent co-host. I am I am the most frequent host. So uh, <laughs> and sometimes you're the, sometimes you're the host because I I get sick or something like that or I, get, I have a bad timing on something. Um, I will be. Once again, this is, again, like I said, the last week in Tijuana for probably a month or two, um, and maybe even longer than that. It kind of depends on when I can get my passport renewed. And then uh, I'm going to be back in Portland, so you'll see the uh, the Portland big white wall, because there's not really anything behind me. It's kind of just a really boring set, but uh, it'll be there. It'll be there. All right, guys, thank you much for uh, joining me today, and uh, we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly. 